If you clicked on this video, you likely have heard the term carbon sequestration. But what exactly is carbon sequestration? And what is not carbon sequestration? These two questions, as well as why we care about carbon sequestration, are what I plan to answer in this video. But before we get to that, I am super excited to thank the sponsor of today's video, and I can't believe I'm saying this, Ren. And you guys know I love Ren. I made a whole video about them, like, back in February before they even sponsored me because they fund carbon sequestration projects as well as other environmental projects. But because today's video is about carbon sequestration, I thought it was the perfect video to promote this opportunity to actually do something about carbon sequestration rather than just talking about it. So if you would like to know how to directly contribute to carbon sequestration with Ren, stick around to the end of the video because I'll talk a little bit more about them, what they do, as well as give you guys a special offer. But obviously, before I can talk about them and the projects they fund, I have to kind of define carbon sequestration. So let's get back to the video. So before we talk about what carbon sequestration is, let's kind of define carbon. Because I feel a lot of people have a misconception that carbon, specifically carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, is a bad thing. But it's not. There are two major types of carbon I'll discuss in this video. Inorganic carbon, such as CO2 and organic carbon, or as I've abbreviated here, OC. We all know that plants photosynthesize. What does this mean? They take up CO2 and they release oxygen. But where does the C go? Where does the carbon go? Well, that carbon from the carbon dioxide is actually converted into OC, organic carbon, and it is stored in the plant's biomass, their body. They make up their body with carbon. We also make up our bodies with carbon by eating plants, but they do it by using inorganic carbon, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, rather than having to eat themselves. So once the organic carbon is stored as biomass, it then can be buried and preserved in the rock record, and fossil fuels actually represent this preserved organic carbon that was buried and preserved after, you know, a bunch of plants died and accumulated in the sediments. Because we burn fossil fuels, aka oxidize fossil fuels, we actually are converting during that process the OC, the organic carbon, to inorganic carbon, or CO2, which then is released into the atmosphere. Because this process typically takes, you know, millions of years, geologic time scales to actually usually occur because the rocks have to be uplifted and then oxidized slowly over time. Uh, but we are expediting that process by digging down into earth, finding the deposits and releasing it directly without having to go through that geologic uplift, that really long geologic process to actually get that organic carbon finally recycled back into the atmosphere. Because we're expediting that, we are increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. But that is not the topic of this video. I just wanted to point out that that process is occurring. We are also, in fact, hindering Earth's ability to sequester and store organic carbon. And that is what we'll be talking about in this video. So I'd like to highlight my main reference for this video, which is the documentary Kiss the Ground. I talked about this or promoted this on my YouTube channel when I first heard about the documentary, when it first came out. I am still super excited about this documentary and hope more people watch it uh, because it is really insightful and I believe it's on YouTube. It's also on Netflix, so you can just find it pretty much anywhere and watch that. It's really just enlightening and kind of opens your eyes to a lot of things going on I had no idea about. But I am going to talk today about the more sciencey parts or like the sciencey summary of that documentary and kind of what it's getting at in terms of carbon sequestration and the processes of carbon sequestration and how we are hindering it with our current modern agricultural practices. So to get right to the bottom of it, tilling soil is really increasing erosion rates uh, that basically causes the soil to turn into dirt or just dry, infertile desert land uh, very quickly and much more quickly than, you know, natural geologic processes would have caused that to happen. And this is aptly named desertification when the soils just go infertile and dry and they no longer produce anything and we have to move on to the next land and do it again. And desertified soils release carbon dioxide and water to the atmosphere 
both of which, carbon dioxide and water vapor, are greenhouse gases. In this map, we're seeing global carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere going more toward blue is less carbon dioxide and more toward yellow, orange, and red is more carbon dioxide. And as we can see in June and July, when soils are covered in vegetation, there is much less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because it's stored in the vegetation and the soil, which we'll get to in a second. But during April and May, you can see there is so much carbon dioxide released to the atmosphere. Why during April and May of the same year, might I add? Well, that is when we're tailing soils. And it turns out that because we're increasing these erosion rates to such a great extent through our agricultural practices, two thirds of the world is desertifying. And it's projected that by 2050, one billion people will be displaced due to desertification of land. And it's estimated that the world's remaining topsoil will be gone in 60 years, which loosely translates to we have 60 more harvests left. And that is something they highlighted in the documentary that I just, my mind was blown when I heard that. A lot of people might ask, well, how do we, this, this one species on planet, have such a great effect? Well, one, we're everywhere. And two, desertification is a positive feedback loop. What does this mean? Well, positive climate feedback loops are loops in which one climate trend causes something that worsens that trend. For example, desertification by tilling leads to the release of water vapor and carbon dioxide, which leads to more warming and drought, which leads to more desertification. So that's one reason that desertification is spreading super rapidly after we just set it off. So what we want to have happen is more plants to grow in the soil and sequester the carbon but also, and this is the key point, store it in the soils. So many people think that it's just reliant on, oh, we just have to plant trees and they'll sequester the carbon and store it, but they will not store it, at least not long term. We must rely on microbes, soil microbes, to actually do the taking of plant litter, aka organic carbon, and storing it longer term in the soil. Therefore, taking care of soil microbes is key to increasing the soil's capacity, well, the plants and the soil's capacity for sequestering and storing carbon. This actually also would benefit us by providing us more nutrients. Those microbes provide the plants essential nutrients that we also need. But the unfortunate thing here is that our own health is suffering as well as our soil's ability to store carbon is suffering because we kill soil microbes by spraying toxic chemicals on them. And this is another positive feedback loop because the more we till, the weaker the soil becomes and the more spraying of chemicals that we feel we need to do. And we've sprayed so much that the plants we've grown for years and years actually take more fertilizer, more nitrogen, nutrients, and fertilizer to grow than they did a few decades ago. And these toxic chemicals not only kill soil microbes that are essential for carbon storing as well as our health, but they also seep into things like our water that we drink and the food that we eat. And some of these, like glyphosate, highlighted in the Kiss the Ground documentary, can cause cancer. And even the ones that don't cause cancer kill our microbiome. So if they're in the water we drink and the food that we eat, they're killing our microbiomes, our essential bacterial biomass in our own human bodies that is super important for our health. So as you can imagine, it's super important that we take care of these microbes because the soil has a much stronger and greater capacity for both carbon sequestering and storing than plants at the soil surface, which only can sequester so much carbon and do not store it long term. So all we have to do is stop stripping the soil of this ability, this amazing carbon sequestering and storing ability that it has naturally. And it's been proposed, as mentioned in that documentary, that if we can increase the carbon sequestering capacity of soils globally by just 0.4%, annually, this would equal global carbon emissions annually and therefore bring us to a net zero emission year if we were able to do that. And there have been projects proposed to do just that. And it doesn't even seem like that large a percentage. We just have to do a little bit that can go a long way. But now I want to kind of transition to why is carbon sequestration important? So carbon sequestration is important because we cannot any longer rely on just lowering carbon emissions to kind of fix 
the problems that we've created. Our legacy load, so it is called our legacy load of carbon in the atmosphere that we've released over time, will continue to warm Earth for centuries. As you might know, methane, for example, is another greenhouse gas, but it has a much shorter lifetime in the atmosphere because it's broken down by light. But carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere for millions of years. And so it's not like, oh, we released it and now we're not releasing it, so it's better. No, it's still there. It's still doing the thing. And so it's important that we remember that renewable energy, in other words, getting energy from sources that do not release carbon into the atmosphere, is not carbon sequestration. It does lower our emissions and it is great, but it does not sequester carbon from the atmosphere, which we also need to do. And now you might be wondering how? One big way is regenerative agriculture. In other words, no-till farming. But you might ask how no-till farming actually draws down carbon from the atmosphere. Wouldn't that just lower emissions because we're not having this huge tilling season where all this carbon's getting released? Well, actually, it could draw down or lead to the drawdown of carbon because no-till farming will cause topsoil to grow back. In other words, that 60 year period or 60 more harvest that we had, well, that number now grows to an exponential number because we can grow back the topsoil that was going to be gone in 60 years. And when we do this, we get 10 times more carbon sequestration capacity in that soil and better plant health. So it's a win win. And more water is also sequestered and stored because rain infiltrates topsoil and actually goes into providing water to the microbes and the plants. Whereas rain that hits desertified soils, in other words, dry dirt with no topsoil, it just runs off and evaporates quicker and leaves the soil dry. So what are some ways that we can do this regeneration of topsoil and ways that we can speed it up other than just not tilling? Well, one way is by using cattle and what's called planned grazing. Cows are not bad, as some people have gotten in their minds. They are actually really useful. And if we, you know, store them in a better way, instead of in dirt pens and actually grazing large areas of vegetation, that is how they help by bringing back the soil microbes. Remember how I said microbes are key. The soil microbes are what create the topsoil by breaking down the plant litter and creating humus, a layer of humus or topsoil. It's just organic material that the microbes break down the plant material into. That humus is super important. And because cows bring back microbes with poop and urine that they spread around while grazing, this topsoil regeneration process is sped up because then the microbes bring back the topsoil very quickly by using the organic matter or the plants at the surface to create humus. And that humus then stores carbon. Note that humus or topsoil organic carbon delivers nutrients to the crops, so it is a win-win situation. And again, microbes are required to extract the nutrients from the humus, organic carbon, or humates and fulvates are just types of organic carbon in topsoil. And because these microbes are required to do so, it is no wonder that it takes more fertilizer, more nutrients, to grow the same crops as it did decades ago because now we've killed off all those microbes and we are now required to play the part of the microbes and provide the nutrients to the plants. Without the microbes, they're not getting those nutrients delivered to them anymore. So it is really important that we bring back the microbes to reduce our use of fertilizer as well as increase the capacity for sequestering and storing carbon in the soil. Another way we can speed up regeneration of topsoil as well as recycle our trash is composting. Again, the key here is microbes as well as other, you know, organisms that help to break down organic matter and create humus. Some countries have already started to try and implement composting for this exact reason, and they have separate containers for food waste compared to other waste. So that is kind of how they're starting to implement this strategy. And yes, these strategies seem really, really simple, like planned grazing and composting seems like no-brainers, 
but we're not doing them. There are many other examples as listed in this table from this 2019 paper that I will link in my description down below, as well as others mentioned in the Kiss the Ground documentary. And I will put in all the helpful links to resources and references in the description so you can check those out for yourself. But now I want to talk a little bit about other ways that carbon can become sequestered because soil is not the only way. There's also silicate weathering, which causes carbonate formation, which causes long term like even longer than soils, like millions of years, because it's a rock. <laughs> so how does this work? Well, recall from my recent clay videos, I think one's out by now and maybe the next one will come out next week. But in my clay videos, I talk about how clay is a secondary precipitate that forms from silicate weathering because during silicate weathering or the weathering of rocks that contain silica, which is 90% of Earth's crust, uh, these silicates or minerals release ions like calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium during their dissolution. These ions not only provide nutrients to microbes and plants, because these ions include some major nutrients that the plants and microbes need, but also promote calcium carbonate formation. Calcium carbonate is just the main mineral in things like limestone and dolostone. And as you can see here, the formula contains, what does it contain? Oh, it contains carbon. And the reason it's sequestering carbon is because if we look at the formula here or the reaction that takes place during silicate weathering is the silicate mineral that contains the calcium releases the calcium ion, which then reacts with dissolved bicarbonate ions in the rain or whatever's doing the dissolution of the silica. And that forms the calcium carbonate mineral, which is then a solid material that holds that carbon for millions of years. So this is two carbon sequestration pathways in one. One way silicate weathering promotes carbon sequestration is by providing nutrients to microbes and plants that then create topsoil and sequester and store carbon, and also by forming carbon-containing minerals, like calcium carbonate, that store the carbon long term. And this is a triple whammy of benefits and win-win-win scenarios because the enhanced marine carbonate formation from enhanced silicate weathering leads to a more buffered ocean. So currently, because of increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, the ocean is acidifying. It's not like becoming super acidic. It's already on the more basic side of things, near neutral. But this slight acidification can have a major effect on organisms like corals, for example, which are being hit by a double whammy, both warming as well as acidification of the oceans, which literally dissolves their skeletons, their calcium carbonate skeletons. So with more calcium carbonate production, it leads to a more buffered ocean that won't change as quickly in pH and will be more safe for those organisms to continue living in. Another benefit of weathering is that it's a positive feedback loop in a good direction, or at least a balancing direction compared to our current trend. Because weathering provides microbes nutrients, the microbes enhance weathering rates even further, and so on and so on to enhance the weathering and enhance carbon sequestration and storage. And on a global scale, weathering is a negative feedback for the current warming trend because more warming leads to more rain and enhanced weathering rates, and that leads to cooling. Weathering eventually leads to cooling because it sequesters carbon, which would otherwise be warming the atmosphere, so it indirectly cools. But this negative feedback that balances out the current warming trend only occurs on geologic timescales because mineral weathering and mineral formation after the fact takes millions of years to actually happen and to have that cooling effect. And because it takes so long for this process to actually take up the carbon that we are pumping out at much faster rates, uh, we need to speed up the weathering process. We need to speed it along a little bit to kind of lock in this feedback to help cool or balance out the current trend. How can we do this, you ask? How can you help to sequester more carbon through carbon sequestration mechanisms just like this one? Well, that brings me to Bren. 
like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, Ren is the sponsor for this video. Thank you so much for sponsoring this video, Ren. We love you. And what's great about Ren is they give us regular people a means to directly help offset our own carbon footprint by funding carbon sequestration projects directly. They're currently funding projects like mineral weathering in Scotland, which implements and speeds up this exact silicate weathering process I was just talking about. And they have community tree planting projects, which are not only sequestering carbon, but improving the quality of the soil, which then sequesters carbon. And they have so many other things going on that you can scroll through and read more information about to see what it's all about, what the projects are actually doing, and how you can contribute. So when you first open Ren, you can click get started, which will take you to a quiz that you can take to find out your own carbon footprint. Now I have a whole video talking about this quiz, what it asks you, what my carbon footprint ended up being, and how I plan to reduce it with Ren. So to help you get started offsetting your carbon footprint with Ren, I've included a link in my description below, and the first 100 people to use that link to sign up with Ren will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. So thank you Ren for sponsoring today's video and for being such an amazing organization for people like me who don't know how else we can directly contribute to offsetting our carbon footprint.